Private Logs, Petty Officer First Class, Mac B. Guffin, 2019-09-30. We left at 0500 the next morning. It was cold. The sun was up, but the sky was overcast as far as the eye could see. The water was dark and choppy. The Barry and the PTSD parked their butts about a half mile away from the nanny. The corpse field and its disturbing garden of mushrooms and mold were all but gone, having either mostly drifted away or sunk beneath the waves overnight. Cold droplets of rain fell from the grey above as our boat sped toward the nanny. Right off the bat, I didn't like what I was seeing. For starters, the wall of fog didn't seem to have moved an inch since yesterday. The nanny loomed just at the edge of the murk. Its dark, gargantuan shape standing out in stark contrast against the swirling grey backdrop. It looked like a horror movie waiting to happen. But at least we weren't going to go in like a bunch of slasher movie victims. Captain Diomedes decided to come in hot on this one. In addition to our standard VBSS team, we had a full-on badass marine MRF stationed on our ship at the time. And the cab decided to commit the entire force. If I had to guess, the captain was feeling the burn from the people we lost. Not all of the sailors who jumped ship after the collision were accounted for. Several had gone missing despite extensive efforts by both ourselves and the Russians to locate them. It didn't make sense. All 16 sailors were unaccounted for. Lieutenant Riggs was among them. That part really got me. He'd been standing right next to me before the nanny hit us. And then Riggs was just gone. There were four boats from the Barry headed toward the nanny. The first two each carried a full platoon of devil docks, 16 marines in each. They'd been stationed on the Barry for almost three months now, and I'd gotten to know a few. Lieutenant Nathan Brisby was definitely the square-jawed Captain America type. A good, if not deluded, guy by all accounts. While platoon sergeant Jeb Emery was the white Jesus, holy war type. Fun fact about Sergeant Emery was... He felt cocaine was a very useful tool in his crusade. Truth was, these guys were adrenaline junkies, a lot of them. Marines out at sea are like bald eagles in a cage, and after yesterday's collision, their trigger fingers were more than itchy. The other two boats consisted of Barry's very own VBSS. Well, it was a token force, really. Basically, the captain wanted eyes in there that he knew were on his team. All told... There were ten of us. Five on the boat, and five on the other. Our team's role was basically medical backup and fire support. The platoons had their own med guys, and definitely had their own heat to bring to the party, but like I said, Captain Diomedes decided to come in heavy on this one. On my boat was myself, Spoony, Petty Officer First Class Greta Thompson, Petty Officer Second Class Boris Yanner, and that dick bag I mentioned earlier. Staff Sergeant Alden. In case you were wondering, Spoonie's not a med guy. Neither am I. I feel it's best to stay away from meds. That job fell to Officer Thompson and Yanner. The Ruskies were getting in on the action as well, deploying their own recon units somewhere near the port and starboard quarter. We had no plans to rendezvous with them. Given the sheer size of the tanker and its myriad structures, they may as well have been on another boat entirely. Their landing craft had deployed ahead of us, and at that moment their four boats looked like nothing more than dark spots as they moved alongside the rusty behemoth. In another moment, they would disappear behind the port quarter. God damn, Greta said, eyeing the tanker with trepidation. You said it, I replied absently. We were just about a hundred yards out, and the bodies strapped to the hull were becoming visible. If possible, they actually looked worse than yesterday. Many appeared more bloated. As we closed the distance, we could see that some stomachs had distended to obscene degrees, while others had literally burst, their entrails dangling in the salty breeze. Jesus, hanging all these bodies would take forever, 
Greta said. Seriously, how the hell would you even do it? I asked. Greta shrugged. Hmm. Maybe go around the hall with a small boat and nail them up one at a time? But that's crazy, I said, shaking my head. She's more than a quarter mile long. It's freaking disturbing, that's what it is, Spoon cut in. It's a bad freaking omen. We should sink her at range. Stole that crap with a spoon, Alden butted in. We don't need any of that demoralizing shit. The sergeant's reprimand was cut short as the radio squawked into life. Except it wasn't a communication from any of our comrades. Instead, it was what sounded like an old man giving a sermon in a frail, wavering voice. An old man giving a sermon on what was supposed to be a secure military channel. And behind the man's words was this strange buzzing sound. It almost sounded like he was broadcasting from within a swarm of flies. The transmission was clearly not directed at us. And the gods of man shall be exposed for the false constructs that they are. His voice wavered, but somehow still conveyed a sense of strength. As the architect of life rises up from the land of the dead to walk amongst men once again. We were about thirty yards out now, and the nightmare masts were just coming into view. At least the ones we could see. From this vantage point, there really was no telling what lay beyond the lower deck. It's hard to tell how many corpses were swinging around up there, but my gut told me there were at least fifty or sixty swaying in the cold breeze. Above the mast flew a small army of those damned seagulls. No doubt some of them were members of the ship brigade that had unloaded their avian fury down upon us only a day before. Their idols and edifices of the false prophets Jesus of Muhammad shall be broken, and their shattered remains trod into the dirt, the man droned on. Our boat crested a medium-sized wave and suddenly dipped downward into a steep trough. Before the craft could right itself again, we hit another wave that caused us to jolt violently upward. I grabbed onto a railing as the force of the impact lifted my feet off the deck. The petty trinkets and baubles of the God of Abraham shall be cast out into the sea. The voice crackled, building in strength. Their symbols deface. The divisive religions of the misled shall be destroyed and forgotten. All conflicts shall cease. Once again, man shall know peace. United under the true faith forevermore. <laughs> the man giggled maniacally as if he couldn't quite take his own sermon seriously. That somehow made it worse. Spoon and I exchanged an uneasy look. Yana, switch channels and get Lieutenant Brisby on the horn. Find out if he's hearing this shit too. Alden's usual alpha male tone carried with it a hint of uncertainty. Aye aye, sir, Yana said. Oh, he's reaching on up, up from below. The voice came through on the new channel in a sing-song tone. Damn, that's creepy, Yana said as he began cycling through frequencies. But the old man's hollow voice echoed through every single one. He's stepping on up through the dark. He's climbing the stairs. He's building a door. Rejoice! The buzzing seemed to grow in intensity, along with the old man's intonation. It only took a second to realize Yana had cycled through every available channel, having stopped once again on the primary. There was no denying it. Every secure frequency was compromised. He will take the world away from the burning light of this small, hateful sun. Together we will journey through the lightless depths. Our world is companion through the long night. Well, I suddenly don't like the sound of that, Greta said checking over her M4 as she did. Turn that shit off, Alden commanded. Yanner did as he was told, and we were all grateful for it. The sound of that man's voice, with that incessant buzzing, well, it was really starting to freak me out. The Marines were ahead of us. The Force Recon Platoon under Lieutenant Brisby broke off, headed for the starboard bow. The other half of our VBSS following behind them, They'd heard the bizarre chatter that had infiltrated our comms. They gave no sign that they wished to abort. 
We followed the amphibious recon platoon under Platoon Sergeant Jeb M. We were going to be boarding on the port side bow. The plan was to meet somewhere near the end of the lower deck, close to the beam. Our boat slowed to a crawl as we crossed the remaining distance. Brisby and his group rounded the nanny and disappeared from view. The sight of the masts also fell away as we crossed into the super tanker's shadow, and the hull became a rusty wall, taking up our entire view. Now that we were up close, we finally got a good look at the corpses. There was a mixture of rusty chains, meat hooks, and nails employed in the creation of this macabre display. Some weren't stuck to the hull at all, but merely dangled from meat hooks that had been crudely nailed into the corroded steel. It was noticeably colder within the shadow of the Colossus. Standing at its base was akin to standing at the base of a cliff. Trying to look up and see the top gave one a sense of vertigo. Our ships came to a rest alongside the hull about ten meters from one another. Emery's team was preparing to fire their two tail guns. If you don't know, they're basically five-foot-long cannons that fire grappling hooks. Jesus! Look at those freaking holes, Greta said. How the hell is she not taking on water? Truth is, I was trying not to look at the ship. I'd be doing my best to avert my gaze between my weapon, Spoonie, and the deck. This shit was disturbing, and my heart was beating too fast for my liking. But she was indeed correct. When the nanny had come at us from out of the fog, she was already visibly rotted through in places. The parts of her that I could see had already been pitted with jagged, rusty holes. And after yesterday's brief salvo, she now looked even worse for wear. Jagged holes the size of baseballs dotted her underbelly where the corroded steel had given way to the fury of our M2s. On top of that were the hubcap-sized pits the starboard side Bushmaster had punched into her. The ragged edges burned black. It was obvious that the nanny should have long ago succumbed to the sea. There was no denying it, and yet she stayed afloat in defiance of the laws of physics. I suddenly had the unsettling feeling of being watched. I found my eyes scanning the bodies, half expecting to see one of them looking at me with a corpse blue head cocked in my direction. Then my eyes roamed down to the water, as if I was going to find something watching us from below our boats. I was really starting to freak myself out. The soft punt, punt of the tail's firing brought my attention back to the task at hand. The tail, or tactical air-initiated launch system, was an impressive example of human ingenuity, able to fire over 100-foot obstacles. Both shots apparently found their mark. For a moment later, two marines were shinnying up to the lower deck. It was quite a sight to behold. The devil dogs had to climb about 80 feet before reaching the top, which they did so with admirable speed. Not to mention the fact that they had to climb over dead bodies to do it. Almost as one, they reached the summit and disappeared over the side. I think we all held our breath in that moment, expecting to hear the chatter of gunfire. But all was silent for an unbearable length of time. Much to our relief, a few minutes later, two rope ladders were tossed over the side and rapidly unfurled down the length of the hull, one for each of our boats. Both ladders unfortunately unraveled over some of the bodies. It was inevitable. Right, Alden said. Okay, Yana, you're with me. Witherspoon, McGuffin, Thompson, you're on guard duty. Don't let anyone fuck with our ride out of here. My eyes, sir, the three of us said in unison. All things considered, it was an understandable call. It's not like the Devil Dogs were short on firepower. That was more me and Spoonie's specialty anyway. Spoon was packing a belt-fed MK-48, while I was carrying an M249. But it's not like the Jarheads were lacking in that department. And I gotta hand it to him. Alden wanting to climb all the way up there, moving over festering corpses no less on top of hanging suspended from a rope ladder nearly a hundred feet in the air. Well, that took some cojones, but I'm happy to say my common sense would not allow me to have. Soon, our little away team was up and over the side. 
Emery had left a fire team of two marines behind as well, so we immediately commenced looking awkwardly at one another. After about five minutes of uncomfortable silence, shifting my gaze between the marines, my teammates and the boat of horrors, I decided to give the radio another go. I climbed up the ladder to the flying bridge and plopped myself down into the driver's seat, flicking the radio back on. Prophet has come to us at last. The old man was still giving his sermon, but now in a soft, serious tone. The buzzing had noticeably decreased in volume as well. In the guise of man's machines, we shall ride upon his back into the lands of humanity. And there... Oh, no, I said, shutting the radio back off. I stood up and walked over to the edge of the bridge, where I looked down at my mates. We exchanged a look for a long moment. Unable to think of anything else to do, I just shrugged my shoulders. Oh, bugger this, Spoon offered. Agreed, Greta concurred. You mark my words, mates. This is all going to go to pot in a... Before Spoon could continue boosting morale, our attention was drawn to a corpse near the rope ladder. It was about eight feet up, so just about eye level with me. It seemed to have come loose from the nails that had pinned it in place. We watched as it slowly fell inward through a corroded hole the size of an office desk. The decaying skin caught on the jagged edges and tore away in strips, leaving long, stringy tatters of grey flesh in its wake. A second later, we heard a splash. So there is water in there after all, Greta said, her gaze lingering on the hole. Then she turned to look up at me. Let's get a light in there, she said and ducked into the cabin to find something suitable. I immediately felt apprehensive, but I couldn't figure out why. From the look on Spoon's face, I could tell that he felt the same. Okay, Greta said excitedly as she exited the cabin. In her hand was a large LED spotlight. She climbed up the ladder, Spoon following quickly behind. All righty, she said, raising the light. Let's see what's going on inside this mystery ship. The powerful beam clicked on, illuminating the yawning darkness before us. None of us were prepared for what the light revealed. Oh my God, Greta whispered. What in the bloody hell is it? Spoon said. From what we could see, the interior looked completely hollow and till a distance about six or seven meters in. That's where the empty space ended, at an unsettling-looking barrier. It was this organic-looking wall. The tissue, for surely it was alive and not artificial, was rigid and bumpy, and stretched on in all directions as far as our little light could penetrate. It was that same rotten strawberry colour as the mushrooms we'd seen the day before. We stood there in dumbfounded silence, just staring until a sudden motion drew our attention. How these two bulging lines pressed together that ran horizontal down the middle of the wall, stretching in both directions about a dozen feet. The lines were highlighted by two swollen ridges. All at once, the ridges vibrated, or shuddered, really. The rest of the wall quickly followed suit. The mass pulsated once. Twice. I... Greta started to say, but she was cut short as the two ridges separated in a blur of motion. One ridge shot up into the darkness while the other rocketed downward. We found ourselves staring into a milky white orb. It shifted in its socket of rotten strawberry flesh, the size and strength of the thing vibrating the very air around us with its movements. As one, we dropped down, pressing up against the wall of the flying bridge, Oh, Jesus, fuck me, Spoony whispered. There's something wearing a nonny like a fucking shell. No one offered a response to that, but there was no denying it. That was definitely an eye, milky white and the size of a school bus. The air around us continued to vibrate with its movement. We stared in collective shock at one another as the magnitude of what we'd just witnessed worked its way through our brains. We... I swallowed dryly. We... we 
got to radio the others. Did you forget that there's a nightmare sermon going on right now? Greta hissed. Oh, shit, I said, having temporarily forgotten that Murphy's Law was getting ready to make a grand entrance. What the hell do we do? Spoon asked. Wake up, I suggested. This has got to be a freaking nightmare. I almost believe my own words. No, it's not a nightmare, mate. Unless I'm the one who's dreaming, because I know for a fact I ain't a figment of your imagination, McMuffin, Spoon said, his eyes wide as dinner plates. We stared in silent horror at one another, listening to the air vibrate with the eye's movements. And then everything went still. I couldn't help but wonder if its searching gaze had fallen upon our boat. I think we would have stayed there forever, huddled against the side of the bridge wall, unless Greta hadn't finally spurred us into action. We go get the others, she whispered. We tell them what's going on, and we get the hell out of here. I told you this was going to go tits up in a jiffy, didn't I? Spoon hissed. And you were cracked, Greta snapped back quietly. Now we have to remedy the situation in an equally fast jiffy. Okay, I whispered, leaning in as I spoke. I'll go up and get the others. So, you're just going to climb 80 feet up, are you? Spoony asked, right past the Eye of Doom. Spoon's words prompted me to gaze up at the rope ladder. I swallowed dryly before answering. I'll be quiet, I said. More than a dozen guys already climbed up this thing. As long as we don't disturb it, it shouldn't notice me. Well, I was already doubting my words, realizing how stupid they sounded even as they were leaving my mouth. We're all going, Greta said. Or at least I am. No way I'm staying down here with that thing. Yeah, me too, Spoon concurred. And so we very quietly began moving. I took the lead climbing up the ladder first, followed by Greta and then Spoon. The marines watched us from their boat, visibly perplexed. One of them walked over to the edge of the port quarter. He was in the process of cupping his hands around his mouth to shout at us when Greta shot a finger to her lips. The marine lowered his hands and gave a what the hell gesture. Greta just shook her head. We continued our ascent. Judging from the fact that neither of the marines reached for a radio, it was pretty clear they knew the frequencies were compromised. Passing the gaping hole was terrifying. My heart was hosting a Slayer concert beneath my ribcage. The ladder was about six inches from the jagged edge of the opening. I kept my body as far to the right as possible as I climbed past it. Next came the corpses. They were hanging about twenty feet up. That part was tricky, since the ladder was resting on top of a body, and it made it hard to keep a good grip. I got a good look at it as I clambered over. It was a man, probably in his mid-forties, wearing the remnants of a tattered uniform that had once been white. I guess it was the uniform of a sailor from the nanny. Dead, milky white eyes stared out at the sea. But what I found really disturbing was the fact that he appeared to have died smiling. Even through the swollen decay, I swear the guy was grinning ear to ear. This got me wondering about the rest of the corpses. I paused and leaned out a bit from the ladder, trying to get a clear look at the next closest body. The hell are you doing, McMuffin? Greta whispered. Move your ass. Well, I did as I was told and started moving once again but not before I spotted a little baby mushroom growing out of the grinning corpse's shoulder. It looked like it had torn its way up through the top of his uniform in order to bask in the sun. At about sixty feet up, a strong gust of wind whipped across the hull. The breeze was so strong that my feet kicked out from under me. I hung there for a few terrifying seconds, white-knuckling the rung I'd been holding onto. My boots dangled out in the open air at an angle with the force of the wind. I dared not look down as I struggled to regain my footing. Thankfully, the wind finally relented, and after a few more panic heartbeats, my boots found the ladder once again. After another grueling couple of minutes, 
I reached the top and hauled myself over the wall. Then I turned to give Greta a hand. Soon all three of us were safely leaning against the wall of the lower deck, catching our breath from the heart-pounding climb. Although, given the circumstances, I don't think the word safely is exactly accurate. Raising our weapons, we scanned the area. None of our comrades could be seen. I silently thank God that the deck wasn't as disgusting as the hull, though it was plain to see that there hadn't been any custodial work performed in quite some time. Bird guano spat at the deck, and other less identifiable liquids poured in dents and divots in the steel. The deck leading out toward the edge of the bow was completely devoid of life. To our right, about twenty metres away, was the first of many buildings and way off in the distance loomed the hazy form of the Nanny's Bridge, towering like a castle. A forest of steel sprawled out between us and its walls. We moved quickly and quietly toward the building. One of the masts lay between us and the structure. An almost steady sprinkle of bird droppings were plummeting from above and spattering on the deck near its base. We gave the mast a wide berth as we continued forward. The only sounds were the coy seagulls high above, and the distant lap of cold water far below. The deck had patches of rust, but it was nowhere near as bad as the hull. Everywhere could be seen large brown stains that I instinctively knew was dry blood. Judging from how many I could spot at a cursory glance, it looked like there had been a massacre here. Look, Spoonie whispered, pointing toward the building. There's Sergeant Alden. Spoon was right. There, behind the bay windows of the first building, was both Alden and Janet, who looked to be bent in concentration over something. The Marines were nowhere in sight. We hurriedly entered the building, which consisted of a huge open room divided by a long counter that ran nearly the entire width of the space. Janet and Alden were messing with a radio. Alden was over a desktop next to the radio, presumably trying to find some way of contacting the Barry. Static poured out of the speakers when we entered, the old man seeming to have finally concluded his sermon. Why the hell aren't you guys out with the boat? The sergeant asked, not looking up from what he was doing. The tone of his voice was unsettling. It had none of the force that Alden was so well known for. He sounded scared. Sergeant Alden... I began. We have to get off the ship. Yeah, no shit, he said, not looking up as he tapped away on the computer. This OP is foobar. We can't contact the Barry. Every frequency is jammed, and there's a goddamn corpse garden in the back. What? I asked, not sure that I really wanted to hear the answer. Go see for yourself, Alden said. The devil dogs are running recon back there right now. We got something worse than that, Sarge. Spoony chimed in. There's something wearing the nonny. The sergeant stopped tapping with the keyboard and looked up at us for the first time. Something wearing the nanny. He repeated the word slowly, as if trying to decipher a code. Well, we don't know for sure if it's exactly wearing the... I started, but Alden cut me off. You've lost your minds. Is that it? He stood up, wearing an incredulous look on his face. He looked over at Yana. You heard it too, Yana. This situation is too big for us to handle. Comms are compromised, and part of our team is becoming dangerously unhinged. Time to go. Alden had clearly been looking for any reason to get off this ship. Whatever he'd seen had him spooked pretty bad. Yenna looked between us and the sergeant. I am... Um, uh, was all he came up with in reply. Thump. Thump. An ever so faint sound came echoing up from somewhere deep down in the ship. Slowly all of our eyes went down to the floor. came the sound again. What the hell is that? Alden whispered, looking at us with wide eyes. 
The fear in his voice said that he already knew what it was. We all knew. The ship had a pulse. Somewhere way down in the depths of this diseased monolith echoed a rhythmic pounding. Faint but undeniable. It's the black heart of the beast, Spoonie said in a grave tone. She's pounding away somewhere down in the dark. We're not bullshitting you, Sarge, Greta said quietly. There's something big, real big, down inside the hull. It struck me then, how we had all decided to start whispering without having verbally agreed upon it. I think we were all instinctively afraid that the thing below would hear us talking about it. Holy shit, Alden said, his face all but drained of colour as it finally dawned on him we wouldn't make this kind of crap up. He abruptly stood up. We're getting off this ship right now, he whisper shouted. The dude's eyes were as wide as dinner plates. We have to get the others first, I pointed out. To hell with that, he hissed. They're off playing in the corpse farm. They got themselves a box of Crayolas and are having themselves a scouting party. He started moving toward the front door. Sarge! We can't leave them, Greta hissed back. You want to go find them? That's on you. I'm going back to the boat. I'll wait for you there. Alden was practically doing a tiptoe jog. Under other circumstances, the sight would have been funny. Then, almost as an afterthought, he turned his head and hissed over his shoulder. And hurry the hell up. Then he disappeared through the door. Yanair trailed after him. He paused at the threshold and looked back at us, offering us a final shrug before exiting the same way as our sergeant. Unbelievable, Spoonie shook his head. Let's move, Greta hissed. Without another word, we moved across the large room, heading toward the door that led to the back entrance. At a quick glance, it was clear that this place had been made into some impromptu medical bay. Open gauze pads and used syringes lay discarded on the floor. Atop the countertop that divided the room lay an assortment of half-full and half-empty pill bottles. Their contents spilled out like candy across the improvised medical workstation. In addition to this was something I just found bizarre. Strewn across the counter and floor was, of all things, what had to be at least a hundred used sunny wipes like someone had made a last stand against the encroaching rot, swiping away madly as an army of bacteria encircled them. A strange symbol was painted against the back wall in what I could only assume was dry blood. The shapes it was comprised of were disturbing. Its design consisted of three crudely drawn circles, one with two stacked on top of it, drawn side by side. The circles were complemented by three jagged arrows jutting out from between them. Fascinated, I stepped closer, my eyes running up and down the jagged lines. I don't know why, but I literally felt like it was drawing me in, and I had to consciously make an effort to look away from it. And then I saw it. Something that demanded my attention over everything else in this floating madhouse. A bottle of unopened oxy, just sitting there, minding its own business near the end of the counter. I was drawn to it like a moth to a flame. I sidled up next to it like it was a cute girl at a bar, and I was a drunken creeper. Hey, baby, what's a fine little thing like you doing in a place like this? Slowly, I reached out and picked it up, turning the bottle over in my hands. Perks. An all-too-familiar voice in the back of my head said lustfully, Perks. I looked up just in time to see my two comrades cautiously exit the back door of the building, weapons raised. I slammed the bottle back down on the counter and literally ran away from it, like it was a bomb getting ready to explode. Upon exiting the makeshift medbay, we saw immediately that the sergeant hadn't been exaggerating about there being a farm or at least a makeshift one. As unbelievable as it sounds, after just a few feet from the door stood the base of a hill made of dirt. 
the soul stretching on in both directions until stopping in the distance at the deck walls on either side. Cautiously, we ascended the slope, which rose at a moderate incline about two meters from the deck. I half expected the dirt to go along with the pervading theme of grossness that the nanny seemed to have fully embraced, but instead it looked like perfectly normal soil. Actually, it looked and smelled like some high-grade stuff. My uncle had a farm I used to have out on when I was younger. After that, I put my green thumb to good use illegally growing the ganja in my home state of Ohio, and so I considered myself somewhat of an authority when it comes to judging soil quality. Ah, oh, this whole bloody affair is barking mad, mate, Spoon said to me in a hushed tone, keeping his eyes forward and weapon up as we crested the summit. You're damn right about that, Spoonie, I answered. The sooner we're off this floating nightmare, the better. Now that we'd made it to the top, we could see that the dirt was part of a makeshift field that stretched on for about 20 meters. At that point, our view was obstructed by what appeared to be black corn stalks. Black or very, very dark blue. I couldn't quite decide. Either way, the dark forms of the three-meter-tall stalks swaying in the cold morning air was unsettling. But all those oddities felt trivial in the face of what had been laid out in nice, neat rows atop the soil. Bodies. Their dead eyes staring blindly up at the overcast sky all in varying stages of decay. Lying prone, a myriad of horseflies zipping about their air overhead. And they weren't just dead and bloated like all the others we'd seen. Oh, no. Each and every one that we passed appeared as if it had been in the middle of an autopsy when something had interrupted the procedure. Some had rib cages that lay cracked open, bearing their necrotic contents for all to see. On others thighs had been flayed open wide, deep incisions along torsos marking where sizable chunks of tissue had been removed, all appearing to have been done with surgical precision. Everywhere that blade work had been performed proven to be a boon for the encroaching vermin. The usual suspects were present. Flies and maggots had begun their work on the bodies. All of their bases of operation were centered around the post-mortem wounds. Indeed, the seemingly expertly placed incisions appeared to even be aiding the very progression of decomposition. As the rot that was taking hold of the corpse's flesh seemed to favor an organized pattern, centered about the expertly inflicted post-mortem wounds. Some of their bodies were ridden with the same mold we'd seen on the dead sea life yesterday. Small versions of those rotten strawberry red mushrooms were growing out of a few corpses. What in the bloody hell is with their faces? Spoonie's voice quavered. Some looked like they died smiling, while others had clearly done so whilst weeping. One thing was for sure. No one looked like they'd had a boring death. A voice came echoing up from somewhere beyond the edge of the cornstalks. I immediately recognized it as one from the radio. Though the words couldn't be made out, the strange timbre, was unmistakable. Even that odd buzzing sound was present. We set out toward the black stalks, keeping low as we ran down a path created by two rows of bodies. As one, we reached the wall of corn and crouched. I say corn because that's exactly what it looked like. Now that we were up close, you could literally see ears of corn swaying in the breeze except the corn was a grey-blue colour. The leaves and stalks were black with highlights of very dark purple along the edges of the leaves. The voice was still far, but close enough for us to barely hear out what was being said, though the words made little sense. From sea to sapling, from strong tree to rotting log, the divine path of our Lord is good. The man droned in a voice thick with mucus. Right, Greta said. McMuffin, you take point. Spoon, you're our backer. Officer Thompson was apparently in charge of this little mission, and that was just fine with me. Judging from the way Spoon nodded, he was on board with that as well. Just before we entered into the foliage, a marine with camo faceplate 
and a bony hat poked his head out. The Marine, Kiefer, I think his name was, put a finger to his lips. We stopped in our tracks. Remaining silent and staring up at him expectantly, Kiefer took one cautious look over his shoulder and then stepped completely out of the brush. We're about to make a move, he said in a hushed tone, meeting our eyes one at a time. Been following this weird priest fucker for about twenty minutes now. Spy time is over. He's one sick son of a bitch, though, I can tell you that. And we have some very important intel to share with your commander that's probably going to change that, Greta said, trying to cut to the chase. When he hears our report, he's going to want off this ship ASAP. At this, Kiefer only shook his head. Too late for that now, guys. The Sarge already has some of the boys spread out including himself. Tell him after we make our move. He motioned for us to follow, but paused at the edge of the storm. Unless the ship's about to explode, he said thoughtfully, then turned to look back at us. The ship's not about to explode, is it? No, but... I started to say, but was cut off. Good. Come on, then. We're going to miss all the fun. Kiefer grinned and dug back into the brush. Quietly, we made our way through the wall of black stalks and grey-blue corn. As we trudged on, the only visible thing was the towering shape of the command bridge. Its dark form, low hazy, with distance, still stood out starkly against the backdrop of swirling grey. The tiny shapes of what I presumed to be seagulls circled in the air above the tower. Halfway through our journey, Kiefer turned around to whisper to us. Oh, and don't freak out when you see the horse flies. There's literally a metric ton of them where we're headed. I just nodded, unable to form an adequate response to that. After what I guessed was about ten meters, we reached the edge of the mini cornfield and crouched down. The field ended in a steep hill. The slope dropped an impossible five or six meters before bottoming out into a dirt-filled mini valley that ran the width of the deck. It stretched on into the distance before disappearing into another wall of black corn. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Greta said under her breath. She was crouching on my left. What in God's name happened here? Oh, that's a fucking madman, Spoon whispered to my right. They must have knocked out the bloody deck. Had to have taken out more than just the top deck, Greta observed. More bodies, too, I whispered. There were only four that could be seen from our vantage point. They were arranged in a peculiar cross pattern, the tops of their heads almost touching. What the hell were the bodies? Greta hissed. Look at the damn flies. Kiva hadn't been exaggerating about the flies. There were literally small mountains of them, piled in great seething heaps on both sides of the mini valley where the dirt met the steel walls of the nanny. Our conversation was cut short as the Marine's target waddled into our line of sight. There he was. The man himself. The guy who'd been haunting our airwaves since well before we'd even set foot on this cursed ship. The obese man was dressed in torn and dirty priest's robes. He was old and big. The dude had to be at least seven feet tall. He looked sick. I mean, real sick. His skin was corpse white, making the angry red boils that pockmarked his face stand out in stark contrast. His hair having fallen out in tufts, it left small patches clinging to his skull that stuck out in all directions. A cloud of horseflies buzzed over his head, zipping about in a small perimeter around the rotten priest as he lumbered across the dirt. That's the dirtiest priest I ever laid eyes on, Spoon said to my right. He wasn't joking. The guy was disgusting. Blotches of red and brown stains complemented the ragged holes that dotted his priestly garb. There was something off about the shape of his body. An unsettling bulge on his back about the size of a basketball. I guess this was something akin to what radiation poisoning looks like. Despite his drab appearance, the man wore an expression so jolly it would give Santa Claus a run for his money. 
He hummed a little ditty I didn't recognize as he moved in great, lumbering steps, his movements as methodical as they were slow. Stepping over and between bodies with great care, he paused over one of the corpses. Bringing his face down to within a few inches of the dead woman, his brow furrowed in what looked like deep concentration as his eyes roamed up and down. Mm -hmm. ah, this just won't do, he said, clucking his tongue as he rose back up on his haunches. He raised the bucket close to his face and gazed inside. He looked like a proud father peering down at his newborn son for the first time. Ah, patience, patience, he groped. I just need a moment to work. With careful reverence, he set the bucket down and pulled out what looked to be an ice pick. His brow furrowed, and a bloated, purple tongue stuck out the side of his mouth, like a child deep in concentration. Apparently, he found what he was looking for. Because a moment later, he violently plunged the ice pick straight into the dead girl's forehead. Then he pulled the implement back out and examined his handiwork. Seemingly satisfied, he turned to grab the bucket. Ah, very good, little ones, he cooed. Blessed be your journey. And with that, he tipped the bucket, and maggots began pouring out and onto the girl's face. I turned away, hand to my mouth as I fought the urge to puke. Task complete, the priest gave a jolly laugh and tossed the bucket away. Oh my, he said, like a parent praising their toddler. You are ambitious. I told you that you'd do fine. And now look at you, oh, so proud, so proud. I realized then he must be talking to one of the maggots. That somehow disturbed me more than anything else thus far. And now, the man bellowed to the sky as he drew himself back up to full height, throwing out his arms like a teleanvelgist, addressing a congregation. Now for the sacred hymn of the flower. Hands on top of your head. The commanding voice cut into the man's sermon. Lie down on the ground. Now. Sergeant Emery, along with three other marines, came rushing out from between the black stalks about six meters to the left of our position. Simultaneously, a group of four marines led by a man I recognized as Corporal McCready came charging out from between the stalks on our right. All weapons were trained on the rotten priest as they rushed down the hill the men struggling not to lose their footing as they descended. You could practically hear their trigger fingers twitching. Seemingly oblivious to the incoming threat, the disgusting man looked up at the approaching man with an idiot smile that said, Oh boy, new friends. <laughs> Brothers, sisters, welcome to the Church of Life. The fat man bellowed joyously. Doing the exact opposite of what he'd been commanded to do, he began waddling toward the group of devil dogs. I said, get down on the ground, you disgusting asshole. The sergeant bellowed in a voice that even intimidated me, and I was on this guy's side. Party's over. Despite the threatening commands, the rodden priest bellowed out a belly-jiggling laugh, and took a few trundling steps forward, his wet robes dragging through the dirt. Oh, no, friend. The party's just beginning. You're just in time. This guy is straight up disturbing, Greta said to my right. The safety of her weapon making an audible click as it was switched off, I nodded and glanced over at her. She was white-knuckling her M4. I realized that I was doing the same with my weapon. I silently thanked God it was someone other than me down there facing off with this freak. Emery shook his head, taking another step forward. There was only about five meters between them now. I don't think we'd fit in with your crowd. Speaking of them, how many of you are there? The priest's mouth was home to only a handful of teeth that looked like yellow tombstones jutting out of blood-red ground. The guy's smile was too wide. Dude looked like he could fit a cantaloupe in there. Oh, but you are mistaken, child, 
the man said with the enthusiastic mania of a religious nutter from America's Bible Belt. The grace of our grandfather does not discriminate. Oh, no, no, no. Emery and his men tensed to fire. The priest continued lumbering toward them, guffawing maniacally, his body visibly jiggling beneath his robe. He's reaching on up, he said in a sing-song tone. He's reaching up from the grave. Not one more step or you. Emery's own words were cut short by the of his own M4. Not even bothering to finish his threat before he made good on it. For in the span it took the Marine to say these few words, the fat man suddenly exploded into motion. Having gone from a slow lumbering gait to a dead-on sprint that should have been impossible for a man his size. And I mean, like freaking Usain Bolt on his best day fast. Leaving the swarm of flies scattering in his wake. And he was doing it with his arms extended, like he wanted a freaking hug. Wow, this shit was freaky. The sergeant's aim was true. The short three-round burst of five, five, six millimeter NATO rounds struck the priest at center mass. I could see the back of his robes billow out as the bullets tore through his body. But the monstrous man didn't stop. At first, I thought it was just his girth and sheer momentum keeping him moving forward. But then he bellowed out another madman's laugh, and I felt my heart skip a beat. It was weird, but in that moment, no one else fired. Not even Emery himself. The sergeant just stood there, staring. Mouth hanging open in disbelief as the hulking man bore down upon him. This fucker was actually picking up speed. In another heartbeat, the priest crossed the remaining distance between them. At the last second, Emery seemed to snap out of his trance. Taking a step back, he pulled the trigger of his weapon once again. Carbine spat out another three-round burst. At this distance, even Stevie Wonder couldn't miss. Once again, the rounds tore straight through the priest. But now the Marines and MacReady's squad were behind Emery's targets. Not a good place to be. Reflexively, everyone ducked. Private Jerome Hawkins took at least one round in the leg. He went down hard. Not that any of us took notice in that moment. We were all too busy watching the fitted priest slam into Sergeant Emery. The lunatic gave out a near-deafening bellow of joy as he wrapped his arms around the marine. The sergeant let out a shriek that was unsettling in how out of place it was for his gun-toting alpha male persona. At last! At last! The priest shouted as he and the marine crashed to the ground. At last, last soul, you return to the flock. Emery screamed and thrashed beneath the rotten girth of the man. This brought the other marines out of their stupor. As one, they charged towards the two figures locked on the ground. I made a token gesture of getting up to help as well, which amounted to nothing more than me slowly rising and walking to the edge of the hill. Greta, Spoon, even Kiefer mirrored the gesture. No one was trying to get involved in that shit. The priest brought his face down low stopping within inches of the marine, pus and wriggling insects falling onto the shrieking sergeant's face. Ah, for too long you've been away. The maniac's grin grew wider, and he laughed. Ah, you have forgotten yourself, but now, now the love of God will return you to the fall. Whatever this insane fucker was planning next was interrupted by the three heavily muscled killing machines slamming into him. The priest was knocked off the stricken Alden and sent sprawling onto the steel deck. Out from under the priest's girth, Sergeant Emery scrabbled away on his hands and knees, puking and groaning as he did so. Shit, Greta said, and started down the hill toward Emery's crawling form. Another of the Marines turned and made their way over to Hawkins. Having finally realized that someone else besides the hostile had been hit by the sergeant's amateur move, the priest rolled onto his knees, but Corporal McCready delivered a heavy boot to the guy's face, sending him back to the ground. Do not get up, 
the marine growl through gritted teeth. It was unsettling. Even at this distance, you could literally feel the hostility wafting off the marines. Not that it made a bit of difference to the priest. The guy sprang up like he'd boofed a pogo stick for breakfast. Smiling insanely through split lips and cracked teeth, several of the boils in his face had exploded, sending rivulets of noxious yellow fluid streaming down and mixing with the river of crimson running down his mouth. He didn't even seem to notice his wounds. The priest giggled and put his hands up like an old-time boxer. Then he started hopping from one foot to another, his blubber visibly jiggling beneath his robes. All right, then. Who's up for a friendly game of fisticuffs? He said in a playful tone. I could see MacReady's eyes bulge at the challenge. The marines were wolves, and their blood was up. This motherfucker, the corporal growled under his breath. The marine shrugged off his backpack and tossed his weapons down. All right, guy, he said, crackling his knuckles between his combat gloves. We're taking you in, but first we're going to cuff you, and if I need to beat the ever-loving shit out of you to get those cuffs on, well, all the better. Um, Corporal MacReady, sir, I said from atop the hill. There's, um, there's some intel you really need to hear, sir. Fill me in when we're dragging this fucker back, the corporal said over his shoulder. Um, sir, Spoonie chimed in. Officer McGuffin isn't exaggerating. There's some serious... In a minute, MacReady cut him off. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Burly Marine squared off with the priest who looked absolutely tickled pink at the prospect of a boxing match. At 6'5", and being composed of 235 pounds of solid muscle, MacReady cut an imposing figure, especially with that Game of Thrones Tormund-style beard he sported. But the rotten priest wore a unique menace all his own. I mean, he obviously didn't look like some tough-as-nails MMA fighter, but the filthy garments hanging limply from his obese, hulking form was just unnatural. Disturbingly unnatural. Are you nuts? Thompson shouted from where she knelt by Sergeant Emery's shuddering form. That guy took at least three rounds to the chest and didn't even flinch. Oh, the sergeant missed, MacReady said over his shoulder. The hell he did, Thompson shot back. As impossible as it seemed, I was almost doubting it as well. I mean, seriously... How could he have taken even one 556mm round to the chest and still be standing? But it was too late now anyway. The two men squared off. After a few seconds of some fancy footwork, MacReady made the first move. The priest was far too slow to react, and the Marine delivered two solid hits to the man's triple chin. Then he hopped back, fists raised in a defensive posture. The corporal was clearly getting into it. You could literally hear the sickening smack of flesh on flesh. I had no doubt that either blow would have broken a man's jaw, but the hits only seemed to enthuse the priest, who responded with a tittering giggle. Then the priest once again sprang into an impossible blur of motion, grinning maniacally as he crossed the five or so feet between them in a single heartbeat. What I did not expect was for MacReady to be ready for this, or at least it seemed like he was. Just as the priest sprang into motion, the corporal began to fall backward. By the time the priest's meaty fist was swinging through the spot where his head had just been, the marine's ass was hitting the ground. Somehow, in that split second, the corporal had produced two weapons. In one hand was a taser gun, in the other hand was one of those special ops stun batons I'd been hearing about. First came the stun gun. The shot was epic. Both darts struck the insane wanker right in the forehead, and his lunatic smile finally faltered. Body convulsing, the priest dropped, skidding on his knees across the dirt for a good meter. His teeth bared and brow knitted in pain. A few of the boils on his face exploded, shooting yellowish fluid into the dirt. Somehow, the guy still remained upright. In the blink of an eye, MacReady was back on his feet. 
Apparently anticipating the man's resilience, he was already swinging his stun baton mere seconds after the priest's knees hit the ground. The blow caught the guy on the left temple. Two sounds came near simultaneously then. The first was a sickening crack of hard rubber striking bone, followed by the air jolting zoop of 775,000 electrical volts being discharged into the man's skull. The priest went down. Hard. Boxing my ass, McCready spat on the motionless heap at his feet. It was in that instant that several utterly insane things happened at once. The first thing that drew our attention from the short scuffle were the mounds of horseflies. Suddenly, as one, they exploded into the air. Hundreds of thousands of tiny beating wings creating a thunderous roar as they rose up into the cold grey sky. The next thing that drew our attention was what lay beneath. It looked like dozens of men had torn at their clothing until they were all but naked, then lain down against the wall of the deck and allowed themselves to be buried beneath the small mountains of insects. For a long moment we just stared in shock at the motionless, half-naked heaps. Their bodies were disturbingly swollen in places. Even curled up as they were, you could see strange bulges of discoloured flesh in places. And the skin that wasn't bulging out was visibly covered in angry red welts, no doubt from the horseflies. At first I think we all thought that they were dead, but soon enough they began to twitch and shudder, and their misshapen forms began to rise. We should have fired then, we should have lit them up like Christmas trees before they got the chance to come around out of their stupor. I think it was their unbelievable appearance that kept us rooted in place. But instead, we just stared dumbly, slack-jawed as they began to stand upright. And they were huge, each one of them towering, eight feet at least. The scraps of tattered clothing that clung to their bloated bodies indicating that they'd once been sailors of the nanny. Now that they'd risen to full height, their deformities were all too visible. Thighs and knees inflated to twice their normal size. Shoulders whose flesh had grown to the size of football pads, pectorals, and even some heads blown up like watermelons. Dude, what the hell are they wearing? Greta said, eyes wide and staring. I think it took Greta saying that to get my eyes to make sense of what I was seeing. It wasn't their bodies that had blown up like balloons. Oh no, that would have been far more pleasant. To our collective horror, we realised that they'd sewn huge chunks of other people onto their own bodies, and not just the flesh of humans. It looked like they'd picked through yesterday's graveyard, cutting slabs and wedges of whale blubber, and stitching it to their own skin like some kind of horrific Cronenberg-esque body armour. It was hard to tell where their pockmarked flesh ended, and their makeshift flesh began. Then, as one, they began moving toward us. Some raised rusty pistols and shotguns. Others brandished corroded knives, pitted with holes. The rest were armed with nothing more than jagged pieces of metal or pipes. Thick milky white and yellow liquids running in rivulets and dripping down their raised arms. Welcome, brothers and sisters, one of the man-things bellowed jovially from beneath his makeshift helmet of whale fat, his long flabby arms spreading out in a gesture of embrace. Welcome to the congregation. Everyone, fall back, MacReady shouted, and opened fire. Back to the boats on the double. The devil dogs fell instantly into an organized retreat. There were twelve marines now. Five marines took up firing positions and opened up on the approaching horde, while one grabbed the wounded Hawkins, and Greta dragged a vomiting Sergeant Emery to his feet. The one thing we had going for our little group of intrepid adventurers was that the enemy was slow as molasses, moving like diseased sloths across the deck. I sprang into motion, running down to Greta in order to help her drag the sergeant up the hill. Spoon came about halfway down and opened up with his S.A.W. 
The staggering volume of lead thundering into the approaching mass of flesh was incredible. The lead monstrosities did a jiggling, shuddering dance as the deadly storm of high-velocity rounds tore into them. A few went down. Many others raised up arms covered in dead whale blubber and decaying flesh to shield themselves, and pressed on through the maelstrom. One of the monstrous men had been moving considerably faster than his lumbering brethren, and before we knew it, he was stomping amongst the group covering our retreat. They were positioned at the base of the hill. Greta and I were more than halfway up the hill now. My heart was thundering in my chest as I looked down toward the towering figure. Even at this distance, his stench was enough to make my eyes water. I'm pretty sure that if I didn't have a waterfall of adrenaline shooting through my system at the time, I surely would have puked right then and there. The disgusting freak had to be at least nine feet tall, his shoulders nearly half as wide. The naked, blood-stained torso of a man was placed on his chest like a breastplate. The mutilated upper body hung by short, rusty chains attached to wicked-looking meat hooks. The hooks were embedded deep into the flesh of the giant's shoulders. His head and face were completely hidden by the grey flesh of what I guessed was a huge strip of shark meat. The tightly wrapped flesh was stitched in such a way that it reminded me of a medieval knight. Two small holes had been cut into the rancid flesh, providing eye holes for the thing. That was it. Not even a goddamn hole for breathing. The giant had taken the small group by surprise. One hand hung down at his side, gripping a badly rusted pump-action shotgun. His free hand shot out at the nearest good guy. A meaty hand closed around the marine's neck. The freak lifted the man, who at the very least had to be two hundred pounds of pure muscle, up off the deck and into the air, making the motion look effortless. The other three marines refocused their attention on the more immediate threat. The giant's grotesque body armor trembled and shook with the impact of bullets, and he took a few staggering steps backward as bullets found living skin beneath dead flesh. But he didn't go down. Instead, he chortled hysterically, his shoulders bouncing up and down along with his laughter. All is ash, he said with glee. All is dust. And he turned and flung the marine toward the rest of his oncoming brethren. The big man cartwheeled through the air like a ragdoll, before disappearing with a scream into the oncoming tide of diseased flesh. Aaron, back! One of the other marines shouted as he charged the monstrous man. His two remaining comrades did as they were told, firing off token shots as they retreated up the hill. The charging marine put a burst from his M4 right into the giant's head, which the freak took straight to the dome, but his face mask of five-inch thick rotting shark meat tanked the rounds without any visible damage to his wearer. The disgusting man just took another few staggering steps backward, and then, with a sudden unexpected burst of speed, he raised up the rusty shotgun he'd been holding and literally blew the man apart. In an instant, his chest and body armor were reduced to a fine red mist. Both remaining halves of the marine fell to the ground with an audible thud. I couldn't believe it. The weapon was in such rough shape, I was amazed that it fired at all. And somehow it looked like it was actually doing more damage than it had been designed to. Sarge is clear. MacReady shouted over the din as Greta and I guided Emery up to the remainder of the hill. Wilkes, frag. Blaine, smoke. Two of the marines immediately leapt up from their crouched firing positions, each pulling a pin from a grenade. The horde was about halfway to the hill now. The frag landed somewhere in the centre of the crowd. The smoke grenade landed at the bottom of the hill. Are you insane? Greta shouted at the corporal. We're on an oil tanker and you're setting off grenades? Go, 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 was the only reply MacReady offered. No one cared to wait around to see how the attack played out. Together we plunged back into the black cornfield. A second later, 
two explosions boomed deafeningly from behind us. Steel groaned in protest, and the dirt beneath our feet trembled under the combined force of both grenades going off near simultaneously. Just as our group exited the other side of the cornfield, a terrible moan arose from somewhere below. The force of it shook the deck more than the grenades had. The sound was painful. What in the hell is that? McCready shouted over the din. It was kind of funny. In all the craziness that had ensued since the Corporal's would-be boxing match, I'd almost forgotten that there was some kind of kaiju-sized nightmare chilling down inside the hull. That's what we uh, came to tell you, sir, Spoon gasped as we neared the edge of the corpse farm. There's something inside the hull, sir. Something big. Behind us echoed the sounds of pursuit. A round drilled a hole into the dirt at our feet. We turned to spot two lumbering figures coming out from between the cornstalks. The three of us let loose a salvo of our own as the others ran past us. The shot struck home. Blubber armor quivered violently beneath the force of high-velocity impacts, and the grotesque beasts were forced back into the foliage. We couldn't tell how big, Spoon continued, but my gut tells me that everything below deck has been hollowed out, and this bloody thing is wearing the nanny like a shell. McCready turned to fix us with a look of disbelief. Something is wearing the nanny, he asked slowly testing out the words to see if they made any kind of sense. We reached the entrance of the makeshift med bay and filed in. Two marines posted up by the door to cover our retreat. What about Lieutenant Brisby and the others? The thought suddenly struck me as we crossed the room. Shots were ringing out behind us now, the sounds of rounds impacting the interior of the room echoing loudly. I heard someone cry out in pain. We never established contact, McCready shouted, struggling to be heard over the chatter of gunfire. We'll jump in our boat and sail around the hull, see if their ships are still there. For just one second, my gaze flicked over to the bottle of perks as I sprinted around the counter. Even in all this madness, I couldn't help but notice it. That in hand of itself was insane. We exited the front door of the med bay, Greta and Spoon were in front of me, one of the marines having taken over from them with dragging the physically distressed Sergeant Emery. It didn't look like he was doing good, but I couldn't understand why. I remember the feeling of my feet hitting actual steel deck, and I rejoiced at the sensation I would never take for granted again. But my elation was short-lived. Spoon and Greta stepped onto a particularly corroded-looking patch of deck plating, and the steel gave way with a mighty groan. Greta leapt reflexively, managing to just barely clear the sudden pit that had formed beneath her feet. She tucked and rolled as she hit the other side. Spoon gave it his all too. Though he wasn't as nimble as Officer Thompson, he still managed to grab onto a jagged edge of the hole. Spoony, I shouted, sprinting toward his dangling form. Wait, McCready shouted in warning. Spoony, I shouted, sprinting toward his dangling form. Wait, McCready shouted in warning, but I wasn't listening. I hit the deck on my knees and scrambled over to my mate. Hang on, Spoon, I shouted. I made it to the edge of the hole and found Spoon hanging on for dear life. For below him was nothing, at least nothing I could see. All that lay under his dangling form was a yawning black pit. Hurry the hell up! Spoon shouted in desperation. I got you, buddy, I shouted over the crack of gunfire. But I didn't have him. For a half second later, more of the deck suddenly and violently caved in, the steel letting out another mournful howl as it bent downward. And then we were falling. Down. Down through the darkness. The air rushing past felt hot on my face. And that's when... Oh, damn. I just heard someone come back into the barracks. Gotta wrap it up. Gonna send this to my homeboy on the mainland. I'll post again as soon as possible. Well, if possible. MacGuffin out. End private law.
Okay, so there you go. Part two done and dusted. Um, quite a long one, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Quite a lot for Sunday evening. Hope you enjoyed that. A little bit less controversial than part one, I think. That's one of my most disliked videos of all time. Although a lot of you did really, really enjoy it as well. So, um, hope you enjoyed the second part of that, and I think you'll agree. I'm looking forward to more of it just as much as most of you are. Well, that's it for tonight. It's Monday again, isn't it? Tomorrow? Oh my god. Story up for your Monday evening as always. And my big Christmas specials coming together slowly but surely. Big things planned for the 23rd of December. Big Christmas party, lots of other storytellers involved in that one. More news about that later. But for tonight, well, it's enough for me, so sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?